Pain Awareness Month. Today, we're focusing on pain, pain management post-op, and we're talking about the methods and techniques that HSS has in place to help patients have a great recovery. Um, please meet our physicians and our patient, Daniel. Dr. Hannafin. I'm Joe Hannafin. I'm a sports medicine uh, surgeon at the Hospital for Special Surgery. I'm Kanupriya Kumar. I'm one of the anesthesiologists at the Hospital for Special Surgery. Hi, I'm Daniel Taylor. Uh, I'm a patient. Uh, <laughs> I recently had uh, ACL surgery here. So um, I'm going to start with you, Dr. Hannafin. So a patient, you, you're working with your patients and you tell them you need orthopedic surgery. How do you introduce that conversation about pain management and what to expect post-op? Okay. So there are lots of different levels of orthopedic surgery. Uh, so the simplest things I do may be an arthroscopy of a knee or a shoulder. Um, and I explain to the patients, first of all, how they're going to be treated by anesthesia. So we use regional blocks, which Kunups will talk about in a little bit. Um, we try and get a preemptive strike on pain so when, when they wake up after their surgery they're not in pain because the body part that we've worked on is numb. And then we begin to utilize pain medication after and we have a somewhat unique approach. Um, I use non-steroidal anti-inflammatories as a way to manage pain and we use round-the-clock Tylenol. So over-the-counter Tylenol is a really effective pain medication. And then we teach the patients that the third phase of this pain management is the use of narcotics, but really only if they need it. And so if you separate out the narcotic and the Tylenol, which you can do, um, then you know whether you just need Tylenol or whether you need something more than Tylenol. For bigger procedures, like an ACL reconstruction or rotator cuff repair, someone may need narcotics for two or three days, but for a simple knee scope, they may not need them at all. Uh, we often give a few, just so patients know they have it if they're worried. Um, and I think it's important to talk to patients about expectations of pain. If you make an, if you cut your hand, you have pain. If you make an incision in the skin, you have pain. But the question is how you manage that. And not all pain requires narcotic pain medication. And that's what I try and give them a heads up in advance. And Dr. Kumar, um, looking at that subject and, and talking about the, the management of pain, how, what do you say to patients when you're meeting them? Usually you're meeting them on the toughest day when they're actually going into surgery. And how do you help them through that conversation? Well, it helps when the surgeon, like Dr. Hannafin, has had that conversation before. Because like you said, when you're coming in for surgery and you're in a buttless gown and people are coming at you, it's very nerve-wracking, it's very scary, and it's D-Day. You, well, you, know, you, you try to prepare for it. When I meet the patients, often we get questions about pain management afterwards, and we have very similar approaches that, you know, I tell patients it's sort of like cooking. You don't want to use one spice too much, otherwise you end up with something over-salted. So you don't want to just focus on one aspect. You use the non-steroidals, like I, ibuprofen, you use acetaminophen, you use, we have nerve membrane stabilizers, we use narcotics, and we talk about them, certainly how to use them safely and how often to use them, when to think about tapering off of them. But the idea is that we impart to all our patients is that it's important for recovery to manage pain. And there are a number of ways to do it. The biggest thing we can do is set expectations. And Daniel, that's a great segue into, I know you, you recently, or not too long ago, <laughs> had surgery here yeah. for, to repair your ACL. Mm -hmm. Um, was a lot of this information explained to you, or did you have a lot of questions regarding pain management and what to expect? Uh, most of it was explained to me from the, from the beginning, right? Um, you know, ever since you know, I walked in with a torn ACL, this is, these are sort of your options. Um, you know, this is what surgery is going to look like. This is what recovery is going to look like. And so I started to prepare myself as to what the, you know, the scope of the recovery process was. Um, and so for me, it was trying to focus in more on that. And then, you know, as we got closer to the surgery date, it was, all right, you know, this is what it's gonna look like. This is how much mobility, mobility you can expect. And this is how much, you know, pain is gonna sort of impact, you know, impact you in different ways. And so, you know, for me, it was, um, you know, walking in pre-surgery, I had everyone explain everything from, you know, pain management to how to use the crutches to the immediate exercise you should be looking at. Um, and so for me, it was, all right, like I, I basically, I didn't have to answer any questions or ask any questions because they were all sort of given me. Um, and that was really comforting. Um, and then post-surgery, 
you know, it was, a, you know, sort of a combination of, of, all right, you know, the first day after I was just drowsy and tired, and then as we got into the next couple of days, um, you know, tried taking a combination of Tylenol and, you know, um, uh, an opioid and, um, and uh, you know, all right, it, it, I was in a bit of pain, and then sort of post that, um, you know, I woke up one day and I was just really drowsy, and this was maybe three days after the surgery, and I was like, all right, well, I need to start working back towards being productive, you know, how do I take those steps? And, you know, the first step was sort of taking away the narcotic piece. Um, and as I did that, I basically realized that, um, you know, Tylenol was just as good of a solution for me and pain and managing my pain um, as, you know, other medications were. And so, you know, I, I you know, really was sort of regiment, regimenting that um, and keeping myself on a constant cycle so that, you know, I wouldn't necessarily wake up with, with you know knee pain and have it you know be unbearable you know all right set an alarm for myself at three to wake up before the pain gets really bad and take a Tylenol and then go back to sleep and wake up and you know begin the process over again. So that regiment in, in, in talking about that how important it is to keep up that cadence in terms of when you're taking the medication in order to help you through that that tough part of pain. Right. I think initially it is very important to stay sort of ahead of the discomfort, know what's coming, make sure you maintain a level of the medication in your blood, whatever medication that is. And so Daniel did exactly the way we tell them to do it. In fact, it helps to have a very motivated, <laughs> um, incredible patient like him that you know they know what to do. It doesn't have to be, you know, surgery hurts, it's going to hurt, it also is going to get better. Mm -hmm. And what you have to do to make it bearable is stay ahead of it. And I think a lot of people think that the only way you can do that is with narcotics. And like Daniel's just said, for a very uncomfortable surgery, and like Dr. Hanneman said, there's a range and ACLs, as far as I know, are painful. Mm -hmm. um, but you can do it, clearly. Um, and the biggest thing is to get functional. And, and there's so much information, you know, spreading around today about narcotics, whether they're good or bad, if you should take them or not take them. Um, how do you how do you manage that? Because some outpatients usually come in very educated. They they know what they're being prepared for in terms of surgery, and they, they come with the knowledge. So how do you balance that in terms of the expectations, but also letting them know that sometimes yes, you do have to take certain opioids in order to manage the pain? Yeah, I think the parents of teenage and young adult patients are probably the ones who are most attuned and ask the most questions about how you <laughs> use opioids or how you not use opioids. Um, and I think to explain to them that for a bigger surgery in the first day or two, or maybe even three, you may need an opioid on top of your anti-inflammatory and your Tylenol. Um, but have the parents control it. So the bottle is in the parent's hand. So that when it's not needed anymore, the parents can find a way to, to discard it rather than leaving it in a cabinet, which is, we know is a risk factor for young people. I think the other thing we didn't mention is the use of cryotherapy. Um, cold is incredibly positive in terms of helping to relieve pain, particularly for things that are close to the surface of the skin. So, you know, the ACL incisions and the swelling in the knee respond very well to ice therapy. And so I think the concept that this is multimodal um, is important for the parents to know. We use, in addition to a spinal anesthetic, the anesthesiologist will use often a, a block that numbs the nerves that just provide sensation. So it doesn't impact anyone's ability to function. Let's say the front of the knee and the front of the shin may be numb for a day or so. That makes a huge difference in terms of pain. But you have to educate the patients that it's going to be numb and that 10 hours later, they shouldn't freak out because their skin is numb because it's supposed to be numb and that's how we're helping to manage their pain. Um, and the same with blocks for the shoulder and the arm. There are some patients that will have a long-acting block placed where their entire arm is numb for the first 18 hours or so. But you have to educate them that their arm is numb and they have to protect it and they have to be in a sling and that that numbness will wear off. And using pain medication before the block completely wears off is a great preemptive strike, I think. Yep. And at Hospital for Special Surgery in particular, we use a variety of different nerve blocks with a variety of different local anesthetics. And in order to do exactly what Dr. Hanovin said, we can, if it can be made numb, we will do so. Mm -hmm. um, to, in order to give 
patients time to start working in the acetaminophen, start working in the ibuprofen, start using their cold therapy, because it takes all of those little things to add up. The sum is much greater than the sum, the sum of its parts. Um, are there are other kind of methods and techniques that we use in order to manage pain? Um, so depending on the type of surgery, um, you can elevate. Um, and when we say elevate, put you know whatever the affected area is, it should be above the level of your heart. Um, Dr. Hannafin will tell you they also use a lot of numbing medicine at the surgical sites, um, at you know as they with the graft sites. Um, we use. There are other medications, like I mentioned before, nerve membrane stabilizers, especially for bigger surgeries, like spine surgeries, um, anything where nerves can be affected. Um, and those are, the, those are probably the most common, but the, this isn't to say that narcotics are terrible or you shouldn't use them. The idea is that they're there as a backup so that you can recover. Pain is expected. Um, and you know we know it's going to get better, but you should you should know how to deal with it. And if you you know and excruciating pain isn't great for recovery either, as people will tell you. Is there a bigger benefit to limiting the amount of narcotics post-op? Um, I think one major benefit, particularly for teenage girls, uh, is they are very prone to getting constipated yes. after narcotics. And so using a narcotic for 24 hours or even 36 hours, um, they can get very constipated. And so we tell them to have a preemptive strike, to make sure they're taking plenty of fluids and have fiber in their diet and those kinds of things. But when you, when you say, well, there's a trade-off. You know, if you use this too long, you're gonna get constipated. That's an accelerant to sometimes getting off the narcotic yeah. as well because <laughs> They'd rather have a little pain in their knee or their shoulder than have abdominal pain because they're constipated. Um, and so, you know, I think it's a balance. I think you want to treat pain, and, and I think in medicine, we, the pendulum has swung where people 30 years ago ignored pain, and then pain was considered the fifth vital sign. So if you didn't treat pain aggressively, you weren't a good doctor. And then I think now we realize there's something in between that pendulum's coming back to a midpoint where you want to treat pain appropriately but you don't want to subject someone to prolonged courses of narcotics if they don't need it. And there are certain diseases and conditions, chronic pain conditions, where patients do need that kind of medication. But I think a healthy person who's never had an issue with pain before, who has a surgical procedure, you can predict that that's gonna be limited to a short period of time. And that's, I think, the way to explain it to patients and their families. Um, do you have something else you want to add? No. Okay. <laughs> so, um, Daniel, um, tell us a little bit about your story in terms of your injury and, and how you came to HSS. Yeah, so, um, uh, you know, big soccer player, played soccer my whole life, uh, you know, played in college, um, came to the city after school, um, and, you know, I play in a few different men's leagues, and so um, one of my men's leagues is obviously very different from playing in college, right, where you do you know, the full warm up, you know, often I show up five minutes late and get myself together and jump on the field. And now I know that probably wasn't a good decision. Um, and so, you know, I, I was playing a game and jump, landed, twist, pop. Um, and so, you know, in that moment, actually, I didn't really feel any pain, but I, I knew um, just purely from the, the, the feeling um, that, you know, I'd, I'd messed something up. And so, um, Immediately called up my mother, as anyone would, um, and she was like, okay, great, you need to go in to see Dr. Hanfin ASAP. Um, and Dr. Hanfin was able to see him within two days. Um, and so, you know, went in, you know, she, was, she, 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 she knew, you know, pretty quickly what was wrong, uh, had an MRI, uh, dug a little bit further, um, realized it was a partial MCL, uh, partial meniscus, and, AC, and then a full basically full ACL, yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, it was, she explained to me that the process was, okay, well, you know, getting surgery right now is, is one thing, but you basically want to go in with a strong leg as possible because your recovery process, you know, takes a while. And so, um, you know, did about a month and a half of, of rehab, getting my leg up to where it needed to be, and then, um, um, uh, and then went into surgery with, you know, with a knee that felt like it was, you know, 90%. Um, and for me, that was actually really, really, a really, really good thing. And part of the reason why the recovery has been, um, you know, uh, productive to some degree uh, was because I was able to do that, you know, sort of pre-surgery 
prehab and then go into surgery and sort of jumpstart the, the post-surgery rehabilitation and getting my, you know, waking my legs up again. So often with athletes, we hear that, you know, it's, it's very difficult for them to sit still sometimes yeah. during recovery. How difficult was that for you? Yeah, it was, it was, it was tough, um, you know, specifically like the first, say, three weeks or so, right, where, um, you know, the first week wasn't very functional, right, it was on the crutches, but, you know, was home with mom and dad um, and then eventually I was like I gotta get myself out of here like like I just can't kind of leave I gotta get back to work and um, and so went back into the city um, and and you know but was at home for another you know week and a half um, but it was you know during that period it was a combination of you know utilizing the simple you know strengthening exercises um, that were given to me for you know post-surgery um, a lot of icing, so sitting there on a couch, elevated knee with a cryo, you know, with with basically cold a cold therapy device, and um, you know, repeating that over and over and over again, um, and then you know, naturally couldn't sit still, would crutch to work, and and start getting back into things, um, and so, but you know, the the good thing is, with at least with my my experience is, you know, there are certain things you can do. Um, and you know, once you've been approved by your your physio and your as well as your you know your your surgeon or, or doctor, um, you know, biking was huge for me. Um, it was you know the one thing that sort of got me back on my feet. Um, and it started off with a stationary bike, and then you know a few months in, it was or you know said I don't know exactly what time, but three months in, it was you know getting back on a moving bike again, um, and and you know getting my knee moving and feeling active and feeling like you do something and break a sweat like that, that was a big thing for me um, just because it's such a big part of my life and you know I wanted to stay active and and so getting using cycling as sort of my mode to get back into mm -hmm. athletics is, has mentally been such a big thing yeah so and in, and in, in talking about that I know that often you want to help patients guide them through the recovery period mm -hmm. and and tread softly sometimes mm -hmm. but um, the risk of re-injury can be devastating, um, of course, to a, a patient at that time. And then that also brings in another aspect of another level of pain management. Um, and, and how do you, how do you, I guess, talk them through that and understanding that here's the plan and this is the plan that we would like you to stick with? You know, on the first visit where we talk about the potential for surgery, I literally write down the goals for different yep. periods of time, mm -hmm. and I keep reminding them. Exactly. <laughs> I'll say, well, no, you know, kidding, why yeah. can't I play soccer? It's I'm three months out. You know, <laughs> right. No, you can't do that because we told you it was going to take probably seven to nine months before right. you back on the field. And so you just keep reinforcing the same information, and um, and I think that's helpful. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing is to find something that people can do to keep their sanity because you know I've been an athlete my whole life, and if you suddenly can't do anything, it's miserable. So even if someone is in a brace on crutches and they go to the gym and do upper body and abs and Definitely. back, at least they feel like they're still being an athlete. Yeah. Um, I had an ACL very long time ago, 1982, 81 actually, and I was a rower and one of the things my rowing coach did, in those days they put you in a cast after an ACL, and so he hung a rope with a sling from the ceiling of the boathouse and I sat on a rowner gonger and I rode with one leg, and my other leg just kind of floated back and forth. And people thought I was crazy, but for me, it was knowing I was still going to row. And the rest of me stayed in shape until I could actually get the cast off, which we don't do that anymore, get the cast off and use my other leg. So it, I think having lived through that experience makes me understand that you can't say to someone, no, just eh, don't worry, you'll be fine. You can act, don't exercise for a month. That's not an acceptable thing to an athlete. Yeah. It's kind of how soon and what. And so I think exactly. you give them things that are safe, um, and you explain why certain things aren't safe, and, and pray to God that they don't do too many risky things. Yeah. <laughs> and I think for the larger surgeries, for patients who have osteoarthritis coming in for joint, mm -hmm. this concept of you know, whatever motivates you to get out of bed, to whether it's your grandkids, or getting out on a boat, or getting out on the field, the point of hospital for special surgery of coming here is to be functional and if you have something like that that you want to get up and move for that you know narcotics 
you know, Dr. Hannafin mentioned one thing, which was the constipation. They can make you feel terrible. You can get nauseated. You can feel lightheaded, dizzy. You can have hallucinations. One of the bigger things that um, we're concerned about and we see is something called opioid-induced hyperalgesia, which means far from taking away your pain, it actu they actually can sensitize you to pain, so things hurt more. Um, so there are benefits to staying off of them and this concept of prehabilitation and getting yourself and your body ready for what comes post-operatively, getting yourself stronger, whether it's after an ACL or a rotator cuff or a total knee replacement or after a spine surgery, anything so that you're on the road to recovery before you even come in for surgery, I think helps with the overall um, decreasing the use of narcotics. Maybe you could comment on patients who, because they've had terrible pain, let's mm -hmm. say an osteoarthritic right. knee, who have been on narcotics to simply manage their pain prior to their knee replacement, how is that patient approached differently by anesthesia and by the pain service? So the, the tricky thing with patients who've been on narcotics for a, a lengthy period of time preoperatively is that they're starting in a little bit of a hole. As anyone who's been on narcotics will tell you, they develop a tolerance pretty quickly. So where it used to be that they could take one or two pills to get through the day, now by the time they're coming in for their knee replacement or their hip replacement, they're needing to take pills every two to three hours in order to function barely so they can get to surgery. Um, the way we approach them a little bit differently is we'll use maybe longer acting nerve blocks with local anesthetic that'll last closer to the 24 hour or sometimes a little bit longer mark as opposed to the 16 to 18 hour mark. We'll use different medications that, ha that attach to different receptors in your body um, which can sensitize you to the effects of narcotics. They don't necessarily work for everybody, but especially people who are on narcotics, they can help you. Um, and then we might bring in some of the other medications that I spoke about, the nerve membrane stabilizers. Um, for people who've been on narcotics for a long time, we'll bring in a chronic pain service, which we have here, and they have a different approach to managing. Again, the goal is to make any kind of post-operative pain bearable enough to sleep, to eat, to do rehab fully the way your surgeon wants you to do it, and understand that the pain will get better. Anything else you wanted to add regarding that? I think ask questions of your physician and your surgeon. Uh, know what their protocol is. Be prepared for it. Um, I think knowledge is power, as particularly for something like this. And for me, it was you know timeline, right? Like you know, ask for a pretty clear timeline and to stick to it. Um, you know. Yes. Um, so we had a few questions come in. Um, can you speak uh, once again about? Um, Medications um, in particular, are there other medications over the counter or otherwise uh, that can help with pain after surgery? So, the biggest ones, the most common ones that you can get over the counter are the ones we mentioned the acetaminophen, the non steroidals. Um, the way those help the most is the way we've spoken about that you have to take them on a regular basis, on a schedule. It's harder for those to take care of your pain adequately if you're in the throes of agony and then take two acetaminophens and expect that to help. Um, so trying to stay ahead of things can help. The elevation, the ice, um, depending on the surgery you've had and what your and your surgeon's preference and what your dressing looks like, you can do over-the-counter um, patches, pain patches, which you can get at the drugstore. Um, prescription medication that can also help sometimes are um, muscle relaxants. Again, depending on the type of surgery you've had. Um, some surgeries are notorious for causing muscle spasms, so those help with that aspect. Um, but aside from that, those are the most common ones, the easiest to take, the easiest to manage, the easiest to dose yourself with are uh, the acetaminophen and the non -steroidals. But I think it's important, your physician may be giving you um, acetaminophen under a different brand name, for example. Mm -hmm. So that's the generic name for Tylenol. And let's say your physician gives you Percocet. Well, Percocet is um, narcotic and Tylenol in a single pill. And so you wouldn't want to add more Tylenol on top of it. So I think it's really important to communicate with your physician or their nurse or their physician assistant yeah. what your other options are rather than simply adding things on, on your own. Um, and this all, that also goes with the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen or naproxen because some for some surgeries, you're surgeon would prefer you not to take those in the immediacy. 
Um, so I think what Dr. Hannafin said about communicating what kind of pain am I going to have? How long is it going to last? What is ex- you know what kind of pain is okay? What kind of pain should I contact you about? And what can what are you giving me? What can I take? Once you have all those, that's your arm. You've armed yourself with the kind of knowledge that can help you recover. So I guess the key takeaway here um, is that I think we learned that opioids aren't bad, <laughs> like you were saying earlier. And um, just really having a plan with your physician and talking to the anesthesiologist as well and in order to have some of your fears, um, you know, quelled, I think is, is, a, is key. Well, I, I, I would agree. I don't think opioids are bad, but I think it's important for patients to share with their physicians if they've had an issue with opioids mm-hmm. before. So if you have someone who's in recovery from either the use of narcotics or alcohol, Sometimes people don't want to share that information because there's still shame associated with addiction, although addiction is a disease. And so if you have been treated in the past or in recovery successfully, it's really important to share that with your physician because they may alter the way that they approach your pain medication after. Um, I've had several patients who are in successful recovery, some for many, many years, who would not consider any type of an opioid because they fear that as a trigger. And so you work aggressively with the anesthesiologist to try and find ways to manage pain. And sometimes patients understand that that first day might be hard, but if someone's successful in recovery, they don't want to risk that and are more willing to deal with pain on the first day. But I think it's really critical that patients who have had experiences in the past or in current recovery, that they share that with their physicians. I think, and that's the, opioids are a tool. They have risks and benefits just like everything else we use. Those are the conversations, just like coming in and signing up for surgery, there are things you want to ask, and that's a big one. Um, Did we have another question? No questions. Okay. Well, I want to thank all three of you for joining us today. This has been a very good conversation, a very timely conversation on an important topic. Um, For those who have tuned in and have submitted questions, we will certainly do our best to make sure that we answer those. And um, again, if you want more information about opioid and what you need to know, please visit our website at hss.edu.